mom to four boys, and they couldn't be more different from each other. Nick was my second oldest, and I was working at a county hospital when I was pregnant with him. And when I was four months pregnant, I had an accidental needle stick from a dying AIDS patient, and I was terrified. And by the time I was six months pregnant, I had gained 60 pounds. And I was at work when the Loma Prieta earthquake hit. And I remember it was impossible to try to get underneath the desk. <laughs> we hadn't even been born, and we'd been through so much. And when he was born, he was so beautiful. He was 9 pounds, 4 ounces, and he had blonde hair that developed curls, and he was a toddler. But as he grew older, his hair got darker, and he was naturally thin. He could eat anything and not gain an ounce. He also had this intensity about him, and he was always running everywhere. Nick went off to college at UC Berkeley, and I was worried. Cal is huge, and I thought, oh, he's going to get lost. And Nick immediately fell in love with Cal, and he became involved with student government, and he also was involved with Superb, and they put on um, uh, student entertainment on campus. So he would be working with people like Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds and Johnny Depp and Michael Moore. And he just had this way about him that, you know, everybody around him felt like everything was in good hands. But I know inside he was just worried about every detail being perfect. When he graduated, I was so proud. He, he participated in the general graduation ceremony. And you could see he was trying to be really serious up there, but you could see how happy he was from the smile on his face. And he was trying to think of something really profound to say to um, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, who shook his hand <laughs> with the same <laughs> And I don't remember what he said, and I really doubt Eric Schmidt remembers. <laughs> so about a year before, Nick had told me he had applied to the Peace Corps. And just by chance, I had been listening to the radio in my car, and it was about the Senate hearings and the sexual assault victims. And I told Nick, I said, I didn't feel like they took care of their volunteers, they didn't take care of women, and that this issue had been going on far too long. And he said, Mom, don't worry, they're changing. So when he was accepted and assigned to China, I wanted him to have the best experience ever, so I put those long feelings of worry aside. And about a month after he graduated from college, we took him to the airport, and we kept the mood light, you know, small talk. And I didn't cry until after he went through security, and he later told his older brother that he was so glad I didn't make a scene at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And he adjusted pretty quickly to China. You know, he had his language studies, and he had lesson plans he was creating. And then, but he enjoyed spending his free time with his students. So he'd be off hiking in the mountains and exploring caves, and he would be cooking in his apartment with them. And then there's that unexpected benefit of being a Peace Corps volunteer, and that's instant celebrity. Because everywhere he went, people would want to take a picture of him or with him, because Americans just weren't common where he was at. So I know he would have preferred to be known for his teaching skills, but he was enjoying the celebrity part of it a little bit. <laughs> and then we got the phone call. And it was January 28, 2013. And I was sound asleep because something was waking me up. And it was like, is that the phone? You know, what time is it? And I looked at the clock and it said 2 a.m. And I thought, nobody gets a good phone call at 2 a.m. Who could possibly be calling? And I looked at the caller ID and it said Washington, D.C. And I picked up the phone and the voice on the other end said, your son is very ill. He's in the hospital, on a ventilator, and in a coma. 
And those are words no parent ever wants to hear. And so I woke my husband up, and Washington said they'd keep us informed. And that long night turned into days. We rarely ate or slept, and we had to get emergency visas to travel to China, and we left as soon as possible. And when we left, we had hope. We promised our boys we'd bring Nick home. And that flight was the longest flight of my life. And when we finally got to Chengdu, we immediately went to the hospital. And it was about midnight, and the hospital was huge, and there were people everywhere. And it seemed like it, that elevator took forever to take us up to ICU. And when those doors opened up, there were people everywhere waiting outside of ICU. They were in folding chairs, and they'd just wait hours to go visit their loved ones. And we went through those doors, and I was led to Nick's room, and I couldn't believe it. My, my son was lying there, and he had IVs, and a chest tube, and he was on a ventilator, and his eyes were covered with gauze. I see you only allows one 15 minute a day, visit a day, but they made an exception for us, and we were allowed two 15, minute, two 15 minute visits a day. So I would go, and I would sing the song, I'll love you forever, to him. And I'd tell him, it's okay, we'll bring you home, you'll get better, and there'll be more adventures. But Nick did not get better. He would only get worse. And Dave and I had to make the toughest decision any parent would have to make. Nick was brain dead, and there was no hope for recovery. So we gave our consent for life support to be withdrawn. And Nick died in that hospital in Chengdu on February 7, 2013. And it was the worst moment of my life. I had trouble understanding how this could happen. Nick was a healthy 23-year-old, and he was at in-service training when he got sick from gastroenteritis. And now he had died in the hospital. And I would have thought that the Peace Corps would want to learn from this and take measures to prevent this from happening to another volunteer. But instead, I felt abandoned and dismissed that Nick's death was just a, just a tragedy, but they did everything that they could. We didn't believe that, and we wanted answers. So when the Inspector General's report was finally released, almost two years later after Nick had died, it confirmed everything we had said, that medical failures had led to Nick's death. I knew if I wanted to see change, I would have to take action, and I didn't know what to do. I wrote letters and made phone calls, and I talked to anyone and everyone, and when people said, well, how can you do that? And I was like, how could I not? You know, I had to learn how to move forward. So I also knew I had to come to terms with my relationship with the Peace Corps. The grief and despair I felt was overwhelming. And Nick's death was preventable, but I had to learn how to go on. So I advocate I ask for funding so that health and safety can be better supported. I want to see accountability. I advocate because Nick was 22 when he left, and he was full of ideas to change the world. And that didn't happen, but maybe he can change the Peace Corps. Nick, I wish more than ever that you were here. You would know how to navigate the politics. You would know how to advocate for change. You would do this job so much better than me. But you're not here. I'll try my best. Thank you.